Praise the Lord. So good to have you here this morning, and we're going to have a good time in the Word, as we always do. So let's turn in our Bibles today over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we've been going through this book for some time. But I love this book. I think it is the perfect book for the American church today. I really do. Um, as you will see as we start into this chapter today. I want to read uh, the last verse of chapter 9 before we move into verse, uh, the chapter 10. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. That's what Paul says. And now we move into chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became exa our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. In one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Let's say a prayer. Father, thank you for your word today. Father, speak through my preaching today to hearts. Let this be time well spent in the house of God. And Lord, those that are ignorant of the things that are going to be said today, help us to become wise in these areas, these blind spots, Lord, that we many times have. Father, let us grow in wisdom and the fear of the Lord. And our confidence in you at the same time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The key verse, I believe, to this passage is in verse 12 here. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. The Bible says that pride goes before destruction. And that before honor is humility. And... Pride can come into our lives through many means. But in this passage, we see a church in the Corinthian church that was very blessed and had many privileges given to it by God. And Paul reminds them of the generation that came through the Red Sea in the Old Testament and how God had mightily blessed that generation greater than the generations before it, because many of those generations were slaves. And now this generation has been set free from slavery uh, through Moses, and yet their lives did not end well in the wilderness. Many of them died in the wilderness in response to their continual complaining because they wanted to have uh, their cake and eat it too, as it were. They wanted um, God to do other things for them than what was happening at the time. And this spiritual smugness that can come on the church through his continual blessings on us, many times we can feel like we have arrived. We feel like we have reached the pinnacle. And Paul's going to say in Philippians chapter 3, he's going to say, spiritual maturity is understanding that you have not arrived. 
but that you are to continually press toward the mark that God has called you to. Paul says, not that I've apprehended. And this is the apostle who built all these churches. He said, I haven't arrived. I haven't obtained the prize. Um, that's for when I go to heaven to be with the Lord. Um, he says, if you're, if you're mature, you know that uh, you have not arrived, but it's, um, but it's for you to stay humble and keep learning and growing. And there are people that have an overconfidence in where they are uh, in their spiritual journey with God to the point where they let down their guard and they begin to coast. And Paul says, man, watch out for those times. You know, when we go through trials in life, Many times we run to God because we're in trouble and we, boy, we pray and we come to church and we do all the things. And when we get through that trial, when things start to lighten up, those are the times that we've got to be the most on guard. Uh, when things get a little easier, the coast is clear and the devil doesn't seem to be hot on your tail and you feel like you're in a good place, a blessed place. Those are the times that we've got to stay the most vigilant because the devil will come in uh, when we feel like we've done really good and he'll take advantage of that. Do you remember David when he was, when he, when his, he wasn't living in a cave anymore. His kingdom was established and all of his enemies were subdued. And at that time he lusted after a woman and brought her into his house and had adultery with her. And did more damage to his own kingdom through his own private life than anything had happened beforehand with anybody else. And Paul's going to say, watch out when you feel really blessed by God and you feel like, man, you are really privileged by God. Watch out that it doesn't turn into spiritual pride. Over in the book of Revelation, Jesus addressed the Laodicean church and he says, you say that you are wealthy and have become rich. And have need of nothing. And he says, you're, you don't know that you're naked and blind and wretched and poor. And how much you have a dependence upon God. Still, I think sometimes the blessings of God can cause us to become complacent. If we don't use them as a attitude of, uh, for an attitude of gratitude and thanking God for all he's done. Sometimes we feel very entitled. Especially in America, we think that we deserve all that we have. Some people think that because God is love, he's compelled to give you everything he has been, that he has given you. And I'm telling you, God didn't have to do any of that stuff. I mean, I, I'm so grateful for the heritage that I have in God and that I was raised in a godly home. Uh, but I didn't deserve any of it. And I think some people, they just think they, they're, they're the bee's knees of Christianity, you know. And they're the show, and, and it's not true. And We've got to keep a posture of humility. As God blesses this church, and he will continue to do so, we've got to have a head that doesn't become very puffy. And look at our tribe, and look how we do things. No, 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 no. Look what God did with a sinner like you. And like me, amen? And let's not forget where we got pulled out of. But Paul's going to use, he's, he's been talking about Christian liberty here, and how we have been set free. By Christ to be children of the living God. And we are free. We are set free. Jesus said, he, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Like for real. And that freedom, he talks about it being linked to sonship. We used to be slaves to sin and now we're children of God. And we have been translated or carried over from the power of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Man, we have trained... When you get saved, you change addresses. The Bible says we have passed from death into life. It's, it's already happened. The Bible says that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And we are put in him in such a way the devil cannot access us. That we are dead to this world and alive with Christ. And we thank God for the freedom we have. You know, when they were baptized into Moses, we're going to get into that in a second. Uh, there was no going back to Egypt. There was no treading water all the way across the Red Sea to get back. There was no going back, but there was a lot of longing to go back. And for you that are saved, there's no going back to the old life. 
uh, in, in a real sense, God's ruined uh, at some level sin for you. How many of you understand what I just said? Amen. But, but the cravings and the longings uh, for the sins of the past can hinder you at times if you entertain those things. They can really destroy you and destroy things in your life. It doesn't mean you're not free. Israel was free. But Israel still, many of them missed the mark of being useful for the kingdom of God. They were called out of slavery to be a witnessing nation to the world, to be a light. And many of them went after their cravings instead of their usefulness for the kingdom. And I will submit to you that the only reason, Christian, you're still on this planet is not for you. Paul said that he was caught between uh, two impulses when he was in uh, the Philippian jail. He said one is to go to be with Christ because to be with Christ is better. When people die, they go to a better place. Those that have trusted in Christ. Amen. But he said, I'm, I'm here and I need to be here for your progress. Because I know that my life is a blessing to the church. But when a Christian stops seeing their usefulness or being used by God um, as vital to their existence on this planet. Paul says in the chapter that we just read last week that he would rather die than some knucklehead come in and ruin his testimony. The only reason he was alive was for God to use him to minister to people, to grow the church, to win souls. You know, a lot of us are just, we live because we want another house, we want another this or another that. And we got to shake that stuff off. Say, Lord, it's not about worldliness. It's about seeing your kingdom advance through my life. That's why I'm on this planet. And if I stop being useful to you, at some point, you're going to pull the plug and take me home. So come on up here, right? This passage is about usefulness. It's not about losing your freedom in, in God. That freedom is free indeed. And again, he's going to say in the same chapter, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not everything edifies. A lot of things tears, a lot of things tear us down as believers. And he says, these people are types and examples to us not to start well and finish poorly. How many of you don't want to finish poorly? Okay. I want to give a couple of other passages that the Bible reads distinguishing us as believers from these people that fell in the wilderness. And then I want to talk about our similarities to that. But I just want to give a little bit of context here before we jump into this passage. And over in uh, John chapter 6, Jesus feeds the 5,000. He multiplies the loaves and the fishes. And he does this miracle that feeds uh, 5,000 men. And then the men find out that he's gone across the sea and they begin to pursue him and they say, give us more of that bread. We want to become a welfare state and you give us bread like Moses gave the people of Israel manna. And Jesus says to them in verse 32, most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He speaks of himself being the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Verse 35. Then we go down to verse 49. He says, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. And this is the bread which comes down from heaven, that the one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Earlier, he says, don't labor for the food that perishes, but the food that endures to eternal life. Verse 27. And he's talking about himself. He says, when you believe in Christ, it's like eating the bread of life. And Christ lives within you and he endures on the inside of you unto eternal life. 
Again, he says here in 51, verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats, and the word eat in the Greek is phage, it is aorist subjunctive, meaning a one-time eat. It is not the imperative, uh, I'm sorry, the imperfect, which is ongoing or the present tense, but it is aorist. In the Greek, phage, it's subjunctive aorist. If anyone should eat of this bread, he will live forever. So it's like Adam and Eve. How many times do they have to eat the apple before there was death? Once. How many times do you have to receive Christ before you have life or in order to have life? Once. And so Christ makes the distinction here between those that ate the bread and are dead and those that eat the true bread and live forever. And then let's look over at Hebrews chapter 8 for a moment. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7 and following. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for the second. But because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So the old covenant, the first covenant, is the covenant under Moses. It was a covenant of works. And it, it wasn't faultless. It, it's not that the covenant was faultless. It's that the people could not keep it. Are you perfect? How many of you are really perfect people? Wonderful. So God had to do another covenant that's different than the first covenant, right? Because finding fault with them... He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, will I make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. And here it is. Because they did not continue in my covenant, I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they will be my people. And none of them shall teach his neighbor and none of him his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete now what is becoming obsolete is growing old, ready to vanish away. So the, new, the old covenant was based on how good you are and your merit and staying up with everything. And the new covenant is how good he is. And the new covenant is based upon the I will write my law in their hearts and in their minds. I will circumcise their heart with a hand that is not of flesh. And the new covenant has to do with the inward life. Isn't that good? The old covenant had fault because they could not continue in it. And because they could not continue in it, he gave them a new covenant. He said, well, let me just do a work from the inside out in these people. How many of you are thankful for the new covenant where he wrote his law in your heart? And in your mind, and he said, you're going to be my people and I'll be your God. And so we thank God today that he did something for us on the inside that we could not do for ourselves. This is a work of God. And it comes with the new birth, born of the Spirit of God, so that we might continue. I guess that means. Huh? It was faulty because they couldn't continue. And so he gave them the new covenant that they might continue. But now we come into chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. And though distinctions have been made between us and those that came out of Egypt. Are you thankful today that you have more in Christ today than the people that came out of Egypt had? And that you have taken of the true bread of life and that his life is on the inside of you today. Praise the Lord. But though that is true and though we have been set free as children of God, there are similarities and there are things that we have to be warned by by this passage. And I want to 
go on to three of them today. I want to talk about the assets that these people had in Christ, the abuses that they took and did, and then the application for us this morning. First, the assets. Verse 1, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. The word unaware is ignorant. I don't want you to have ignorance in your life about this very important issue. I don't want this to be a blind spot for you because you feel that God is for you and he loves you and he would never do anything to harm you and all this stuff. Don't push it with God. Don't be unaware that all our fathers, he's speaking of the ancestors there in Israel, and the word father in the Greek, pater, means somebody who you could look like, have the potential of looking like. Okay? Don't look like these guys. Our fathers were under the cloud, and that's the glory cloud, the Shekinah cloud of God. That same cloud is spoken of when the cloud came on the Mount of Transfiguration and came around the disciples and told them to hear his son. This word all keeps coming up. All our fathers, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate of the same spiritual food and all drank of the same spiritual drink. So here we see that the children of Israel, they were in bondage for 430 years. And then they are mightily delivered. Y'all remember all the plagues and, and then the Passover? The mighty hand of God shows up at the appointed time. How fortunate they were that God did all of this for them. And then the Lord leads them out of Egypt. And then the Lord delivers them from the hand of Egypt when he causes them to walk through the Red Sea. And there are people that are liberal scholars that say there are parts of the Red Sea that are only six inches deep. And maybe they walk through that part of the Red Sea. And the, then the question is, then how did Pharaoh drown in six inches of water? And that's the big number one question I would ask. <clears throat> but they were baptized. The word baptizo in the Greek means to be identified with. To be immersed into his leadership. And some Presbyterians say the cloud represents the sprinkling of water. And some Baptists say, no, the sea represents the full immersion. But neither of them worked because there was no sprinkling and they walked on dry land. So neither of those worked for either the Baptists or the Presbyterians. But nonetheless, they were immersed and identified with the people of God. And they all ate the same spiritual food. And they all drank the same spiritual drink. That does not mean that the food was spiritual or the drink was spiritual. But that they came by supernatural means. Manna was a supernatural provision from God. But manna wasn't spiritual in the sense that it lacked any physicality. You could eat it. It was physical. And the drink, when they hit the rock, when Moses hit the rock and the water came from the rock, it was by supernatural means, but it wasn't supernatural water. And, and this speaks to the provision of God. He led them. He delivered them. He provided for them. This is what God did for them. Continually provided for them in a wilderness where they could not sustain life otherwise. It says, for they all drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. And for you guys that want to prove the deity of Christ or that he was God, this is a perfect place to do it. That Christ here is seen in the Old Testament as the rock of Israel. The rock that followed them. And he was Christ. Psalm 18, 31. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? 1 Samuel twenty two forty seven. 47. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. And let the God of my salvation be exalted. And so here Christ is the rock. Down a little bit lower, he says, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted. It was the Lord Jesus in his pre-incarnate 
manifestation, following Israel throughout the whole time. I'm going to be thankful that Christ has followed you and that he is the rock of your salvation. And he is the, Paul talks about it in this book. He says, no other foundation can be laid, but Christ, he is the rock that you build your house on, but be careful how you build on this finished work. Because some people will be useful for the kingdom and other people will go off and do their own thing and they'll build their life with wood, hay, and stubble. And he says, it'll be burned and you will suffer loss and, and yet you will be saved. That's what 1 Corinthians 3 says. You want to be useful and not see a bunch of stuff go up and smoke? How many of you say amen? So this is the motive of him writing this. He's saying, look, if you want to be useful, don't flaunt your freedoms to the point where you abuse those liberties. He says two things that you can do to abuse your liberties. You can, you can cause people to stumble by you holding on to your to things that hurt other people. And then also you can bring destruction on your own life here in this chapter. These are the two things. I don't want to cause other people to stumble through me living the life of a hypocrite at some level. And I don't want to bring some kind of destruction on me and this church to the point where I get to go around a mountain one more time. How many of you don't want to do that? How many of you have been through a a mountain of where you just where you were caught up in some kind of destruction and you got to go take a lap and learn. I, I want to grow up from that. I don't want to, and I don't want this church to end there. And I don't want this church to take a nosedive at some point because God is blessing us so much that we become pride and smug like the Laodicean church that said, boy, we have really, and Paul says this to these Corinthians. He says, you reign as Kings, don't you? He says, we apostles are the off scouring of the earth, man. We're just grinding it out. But you guys, y'all say y'all have y'all are reigning and y'all are distinguished. And this was a very affluent church that grew up and started despising their apostle who was suffering. Paul said, watch out when God blesses your socks off. That you lower your guard and say, boy, I sure am something now. And instead say, who am I that you've brought me this far? What is my family that you've brought me to this place? You didn't owe me anything. And here I am because of your grace alone. These people were led by Christ, delivered by his hand, brought through the Red Sea. I don't know about you, but that would have been something to be the child of a slave beaten out of life and the next thing looking at big old fish as I walk through a Red Sea on dry ground. How many of you think that would be pretty? I mean it doesn't happen every day. And then watching all of your enemies drown behind you that have persecuted you your whole life. Or they got tambourines out and had a little dance afterwards because God had completely destroyed their enemies. And then he provided every step of the way. And every time they hit a test, they forgot all about the Red Sea and forgot all about the great deliverances that God had done. And they said, he's mean because he's testing me. They didn't realize that he was grooming them to be a light and a witness to the Gentiles and that they belonged to him. I want you to reflect on all that God's done for you over your life. Hasn't he been good? But sin is insanity because it always throws God's goodness in his face over us wanting to have things our way all the time. We forget, don't we? Adam and Eve didn't have a good reason to sin. People always, boy, life is hard, therefore I'm going to sin. No, you look at what Christ has done for you. And in the light of all that he's brought you out of and in the light of who he is to you, we don't need to be returning him evil for good for the rest of our lives because we're going through some kind of test. We need to look at our asset column and say, praise God, we got more in the asset column because of Christ, a lot more. And he didn't have to do it. 
Boy, I could preach on that for a second. I could blow your mind, I think, some of you. Because Jesus said, Jesus said, if the signs and wonders that were done here were done over in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. Meaning, he could have done some miracles over there and those poor Sodomites would have repented. And he didn't. And why? Because they were terrible. And he didn't know them anymore. See, it's up to God to do with what he wants to with a bunch of sinners. He does not owe anybody anything. Ask Noah. Well, God's done all he can for us, and now it's up to us. No, no, no. Why pray if God's done all he can? God's still around. God can do a whole lot more. He can have a guy put his hand in his side so he'll believe. He can, how I many of you know, not everybody had a Damascus Road experience like Paul did. God did certain things because he's God and he can. And he doesn't owe you anything. And if you are a Christian, it's because he freely did something for you and brought you along. And you're sitting there going, well, he had to because I'm wonderful. He was so lonely up there before time and space. And he, but he knew I was coming, and it just consoled him, the fact that his darling was on his way. And I'm God's gift to God. Oh, Jesus. And that's what gets into some churches, man. They think, boy, I sure am wonderful. I made some progress. And look at me. Let's not let our privileges cause us to become proud this year. And if God decides to do something for this church, and I'll tell you this, I think God has taken us on a slow path in this church and incrementally blessed us so that your pastor wouldn't lose his mind with pride. And we wouldn't all blow up at some point and that we would have a level of strength and maturity to handle what's coming. And I believe that. But God helped me never to get to the place where I've arrived. And am a know-it-all. Who's big on knowledge and little on love. Secondly, let's look at the abuses that they brought to the table because of their uh, pride. He says here, verse 5, here's the shocker. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered, slain in the wilderness. And all these things became our examples. Tupoi in the Greek, uh, an example is something like a, a model or an idol of sorts that has been beaten and imprinted through repetition. So if you're an example that you, you've, uh, if you're a good example, you've beaten yourself through repetition to become an example. You've allowed the discipline of life to cause you to be an example. And these are bad examples here who have through continual practice done evil things. And they are our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And the word here for lust is epithumia. It means to have a craving or a passion for the things that these people lusted for. And what he's speaking to here is not necessarily uh, sexual lust in this passage, this verse. But they lusted after the delicacies that they had in Egypt. And they said, oh, we're tired of this manna. It's manna all the time. Manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna, for manna, manna, manna. And we want some meat. And they said, oh, I think it's the Numbers 11. They said, oh, that we could have fish. And we could have garlic and leeks and cucumbers. I don't even know what a leek is, but they, have, they wanted that. I want some leeks. And it was from Egypt. And they wanted Egyptian leeks. And they missed what they came out of. And now God's got them on this strict diet. And they didn't like it. And they lusted after. And they craved what they had before they were delivered by God's hand. And there's an element of worldliness that tries to come into the church. And we try to bring this in with our Christian life. And we've not made a clean break of what we've come out of. And folks, we've got to let go of yesterday. 
what we come out of and not entertain that stuff anymore and not crave it. And there needs to be no worldliness in the church. Got to watch what we watch, what we entertain, what we put in front of our face, in front of our kids. The things that our parents would not tolerate. Look how far we've come. And look at where we're going. And the church needs to wake up. Saying this stuff destroys lives. It's destroyed our families in the past. And we can't tolerate this stuff anymore. When it comes to craving the things that the world enjoys. There are things that God has called us to in our diet that we don't need to ingest, that the world is ingesting daily. This is worldliness. That they pushed the limit with God and they lusted exceedingly. And the Bible says that God did send them what they wanted. How many of you don't always want God to do things that you... Okay. So, I, don't, I didn't say that right, but you know what I meant. So, God sent them quail. You know that Birds movie, Alfred Hitchcock, man? I mean, it was birds everywhere, and they just littered the place with birds, and then the people were so excited, and the Bible says they went mad over these birds, and they ate all this quail. And then God said, you got what you want? That's how you want to end it? And he killed them while the meat was in their teeth. He said, you're done. Good for you. You got your birds. Got your meat, that's what you needed, and you're done. Verse 7 And do not become idolaters as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. The word idolater here, it was very pertinent in the Corinthian life because they had idols everywhere. And perhaps some of them were trying to bring idol worship into the church at that time. We're not sure. But he says, don't be an idolater. Don't worship idols. And you remember over in uh, Exodus chapter 32, Moses goes up on the mountain and he gets the Ten Commandments. Is this good stuff? Are y'all okay? Everybody okay? And we have good air conditioning on right now, so everybody's happy. And I wore short sleeves today. This is my first day to wear short sleeves, so I'm very excited about it. Uh, But Moses goes up the mountain. He gets the Ten Commandments. And while he's up there for 40 days with the Lord, uh, the children of Israel come to Aaron. They say, we don't know what happened to this guy, that this guy that brought us, <laughs> that brought us out of Egypt, right? And, he's, and they said, go and make us a God that we can look at, see, feel, touch. Uh, and we can say that is the God that brought us out of Egypt. And they called this calf Yahweh. They called him Jehovah. And I believe that they believed in Jehovah because there was no denying what had happened, but they wanted him in their image. And so Aaron was forced into it. He compelled because he wasn't a strong enough man of God. And they take their earrings off and they make this golden calf and they all worship it. They do uh, what Moses said to do as far as sacrifices. They go through the the, the sacrifices to this God. They do burnt sacrifices, all the mosaic uh, instructions. And then they eat. And then at the table there, and then they get up and play. And play is the same word that's used when Isaac was having fun with his wife. He was caressing her. Y'all know what play means. It's not a good play. It's a bad play. It's not kickball. Okay, it's a different kind of play. And they all get up and they're playing. And it's this massive deal going on. And God says, get down from this mountain. The people have corrupted themselves. And Moses goes down and Aaron, uh, uh, jo- uh, Joshua's with him. And Joshua south says, there's war in the camp. And Moses says, no, it's the voices of singing. And they go down and there's just this massive group of naked people. I don't know how to say it. It's bad. It's bad. And idolatry always is hand in hand with promiscuity and how the world tries to bring their idols into the church for us to worship what they worship. And Christians have to beware of idolatry ourselves that we don't bring materialism in the church, the love of money into the church. 
We don't worship buildings in the church. We stay humble and in love with Jesus and genuine and transparent. We don't try to make celebrities out of our preachers like the world makes celebrities out of people. It's exhausting being a celebrity. It takes too much energy. I don't want to do it. I'm not good at it. But we see idolatry, and I don't mean to ruffle any feathers, but when I went to, I'm just going to be straight up with you. When I went to Spain, we went to one church that was dedicated to Mary, and I walk in, and no lie, and I have pictures to prove it. There's Mary, and it's the biggest, it's just not like some village church. This is the biggest church in Spain, right across from the palace. John Henry is with me, and it's got Mary on a cross, okay, with, remember that, with crown of thorns on her head i'm like what is this and i have the guy speaking english in my ear while i'm walking and he keeps saying the worship of mary not the veneration the worship i'm like the worship and they have this idol that you would go or this statue and now kneel down to mary and her little kid in her arm and you put money in there and then they had all these other uh, uh statues of different saints that they would kneel down and I'm like, kneel down. That Protestant stuff rose up on the inside of me, brother. I'm Protestant out, man. I'm like, where am I? But it is, it is the custom in one way or the other for people to start introducing idols into the church and then changing the very image of God in the church. Christ is the only express image of God. God does not look like a bull. He looks like Jesus Christ. He said, you see me, you've seen the Father, amen? And Christ is the express image, and there's no bull. Come on, we need to keep the bull out of the church. Come on, somebody. You take that bull out of here, amen? Get the bull out! How many of you know it when you smell some bull up in the church? You're like, that's a bunch of bull! Got to keep idolatry and worldliness out of the church. We got to be on point. These people thought they had arrived and Paul is reading their mail saying, you guys are impure. Y'all are. He had already told them that God would confirm them to the end until they're blameless. He told them that in the first chapter. But he said, look, I'm not, I'm dealing with you as far as your usefulness in the church. Don't be so free that you live entitled. Verse 8, let us, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. The word sexual immorality is porneia. It's anything outside of biblical marriage. Anything outside of biblical marriage needs to stop. I don't believe that you need to be engaged to somebody for four years. If you get engaged, you're getting the flowers and things are happening and things are moving. All right? People are calling florists and we're getting this show on the road. That's engagement. Well, I want to finish medical school and I want to finish this. And then we're engaged now and I'm 21. But by the time we're 35, we should be married. I'm just going to see if we trust each other. Quit it. It doesn't honor God. And people died over the issue of sexual immorality. God took 23,000 out. That's that love in God you serve. <laughs> Never want to hurt your feelings, God. That's him right there. And Christ keeps being mentioned in this same scenario. And then verse 9, nor let us tempt Christ. The word tempt is parasma in the Greek. It is to test. The word tempt and test are the same word. Sometimes used negatively, sometimes positively in the context it's used in. Don't put the Lord to the test. As some of them also tempted him or tested him and were destroyed by serpents. Sometimes when we're going through a test, we go, well, let's just share this with everybody. Now we're going to test God because we're being tested. If he's putting me to the test, if he's putting me in some kind of situation where I'm being tested, well, now I'm going to put him to the test and I'm just going to send it up and see how far I can get to the 
Y'all ever heard the story of the kid that fell out of the bunk bed? His dad comes in, the kid's crying, and his dad said, what happened? And the kid said, I think I fell asleep too close to where I got in. The same thing with a bunch of Christians. Sometimes they go back to right where they got into Christ and they fell asleep right there. And I think, amen. We gotta, cannot push the envelope with Christ. We cannot put him to the test. See how far we can get. We are free so that we can pursue him and press into him instead of push him. Stop begging for it. And God never did anything to anybody, but they begged for it. Just keep pushing. Until he, as a father, said enough's enough. And we read over here in chapter 11. He says, if we examine ourselves and judge ourselves, we won't be judged by God. But when we are judged by God, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. He says, but there are some of you who are weak and that sleep even today because God has brought judgment on people's lives. So God's not playing around with sin. That's the issue. He wants a holy group of people that love him. He's not into this American Christianity business. He's not into it. He has nothing to do with it. He hates it. He spits that stuff right out of his mouth. Well, you punched a card when you were four and you go live like the devil the rest of your life. Maybe you're saved. Maybe. Some of you really need to take your life into account and examine your heart so that when God, or else God's going to come help you do it. And when he does it, it's to keep you from being condemned with the world. But some people have died over this issue. And that's what the Bible says have happened to Christians. This is not, amen. This is about your usefulness. Don't tempt Christ when you're going through temptation and trials yourself. And verse 10, what other abuse? Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. How many of you have a hard time not complaining? Anybody? How many of you go to, to work just to complain? Punch in the card and let me get to complaining. Or some of you will leave this place, go, my God, that man can preach long. Or, or uh, what other, what other, what are you going to get in the car and complain about? And all day long, complaining, complaining, complaining. And the word in the Greek is, sounds like what it is. It's an onomatopoetic word. It is uh, something. Gung, what is it? Gunguzo. 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 That's all you do all day is gunguzo. Just gunguzo. Gunguzo your marriage. Gunguzo. And God gets tired of it. He's like, you're supposed to be praising me. And all you do is just man, man, man. Nitpick, critical, picking at each other, picking, picking, picking. Do you know that complaining is as bad as sexual immorality? It's one of the lists, man. You go through the Book, the book of Exodus and every chapter, they're just going from one chapter to the next about complaining. If God was good, he would have done it this way. If God, oh, he's brought us out here to die in these bitter waters and blah, blah, blah. And, and finally, it made Moses so mad he had to sin. And when he hit that rock when he's supposed to speak to it because he's so mad. And I need a church that doesn't complain so much because I don't want to sin so much. <laughs> Y'all stop it. Let's all praise and not complain so much. I go to church to eat preachers for breakfast. I don't know about all this. Blah, blah, blah. You got to get that. I'm not saying that we don't have a uh, wise heart but i think that god has to deliver us from a smugness where we become overly critical of everything christian and everything that god is doing right now got to guard our heart have been attacking one another and biting and nitpicking all the time complaining spirit is toxic and it'll land you in a wilderness somewhere and you don't want to give that spirit place. Don't tempt him. Don't complain. 
as those that were destroyed by the destroyer. Verse 11, now all these things happened to them as examples and were written for our admonition, our warning upon whom the ends of the ages have come, meaning we are at the end of the age, Paul says, and we know things these people don't know. We, have, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have things that we know about in Christ Jesus they never knew. And there's no room for complaining. When we think about how rich we are in God. Verse 12. Therefore let him who thinks he stands. Take heed lest he fall. Don't be overly confident. In your progress. Stay humble. Remember the lessons you've learned over time. Verse 13 and we close. No temptation has overtaken you. Except that which is common to man. Sometimes people feel like the devil's really after them. And they say, boy, I've never been through anything like this. This is a supernatural attack on my life. Nobody's ever been through what I'm going through right now. The devil, you know, I had little demons that were really attacking me. Now there's some big demons. This is next level attack. But let me tell you, it may be next level attack. There might be devils coming after you, but they will never tempt you beyond what is human. What is common to man. You say boy I have weaknesses in me. Nobody has. That's not true. There are people all in this room. That got the same weaknesses you have. Whatever you've been tempted with. Is common. It's not special. It's kind of you know. Big devil and lust. Human. The devil just wants you to get human. And do human stuff. You can't, but what I'm saying is you can't blame the devil when you sin. That, that devil, the woman said, beguiled me. It, it was the devil that made me do it. That's what Eve said. And, and that's not the truth. When you do human, you do human really well all by yourself. The word common to man literally means human. Such is human. It's not the devil. Yeah, he may tempt you. He may assault you. He may come after you. But when it comes to sinning and temptation, it just comes down to you being a human being. And you're fallen and you use your own resources to sin. You don't need the devil's help entirely. But God is faithful. God is faithful, you guys, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. Aren't you glad that he is in control even when you're going through hard times? And he knows how to temper the temptation to the point where you're able to handle it. But with the temptation, he also makes the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You can't blame the devil and you can't blame God when you sin. He's made a way of escape. You're able to handle it. Why do you sin? Because of you. Not because of God and not because of the devil. God does not make people sin. He does not tempt people to sin. That's what the Bible says. He puts you through a test. There's no question. But when it comes to doing you in, there ain't nobody who can do you in like you. You don't need God's help. And what is he saying here? Yes, there are many scriptures that says he leads us into triumph. There are many scriptures that says the battle is the Lord's. But when it comes down in a real sense, to you, the battle comes down to you knowing you. And let me finish here and I'm done. To you knowing you. To you knowing that the way the devil is going to come after you this year is the way he came after you last year. Is the way he came after your family 20 years ago. There's nothing new. There's only you getting a hold of who you know you are with your weaknesses. And that you don't make such progress in God that you can go entertain the things that you couldn't before. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some people, they, they uh, what time is it? Some people, they think, uh, oh, I've been, I've been through AA for umpteen number of years. Now, now I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to have accountability anymore because I'm, much more better. -er. 
And I want to tell you that in your body, you have weaknesses that you're going to have for the rest of your life. And it's just underneath the surface all the time. And you've got to keep your guard up. And when you sin, which you will, how many of you know everybody's not perfect? Not anybody here. Nobody's arrived. There is no sinless perfection in this church. That is a lie. But when you sin, you know what you need to do? You need to punish all disobedience. Paul says, I buffet my body. I, when, when I fall, I get up and then I hit myself a little bit. And I fast. And I get transparent with my accountability partners and I shame the devil. And I trust in God that whoever humbles themselves, God will exalt and he won't grind them into powder. Some of you are so scared about going into some season that you've never been in before. It, it may be hard, but it's not supernatural to the point where it's not something you haven't dealt with before. Don't graduate from the lessons of life that God has already taught you. Does that make sense to you? The hard lessons through what you've learned in the past, you'd never graduate from those lessons. And don't be unaware that with every temptation, God has made the way of escape for you. Look for it. And I'll be honest with you, it doesn't say a way, it says the way, which, and the way usually is through and not around your temptation. I know some of you pray for people, Lord, whatever they're having to learn through this trial, just let them learn it, Lord, however long it takes. But when it comes to you praying, you're like, get me out of this trial. I don't want to be in this anymore. I hate this. Lord, uh, slaughter all my enemies and Lord, let everything be peachy keen again. But sometimes trials require patience. And they're God's trials he puts you through. Sometimes they're short. Sometimes they're long. But they do have an end. And he says, you will make it through. God has prepared a way. The way. Of escape. It's not forever. And God is faithful. There's another passage where Paul says, man, I was pressed beyond my strength that I would know that it was God who raises the dead and not we ourselves. But all in all, I believe in God's superintending of what you're going through. It is so that at last you'll be able to endure it and it won't sack you. How many of you thankful that he is sovereign even over our trials? Isn't that good news? Praise the Lord. And he loves us. Amen. So I asked the church today. I ask you to. Hello? Know, know yourself. Stay accountable. Stay humble. Stay transparent. Pray so that you don't enter into temptation. Have a prayer life. Come to church. Last thing I'm going to say, when that COVID hit, we only stayed out of the church for five weeks. I about lost my mind. And everybody else, I mean, the bigger churches, man, they were gone because they're scared. They're going to get sued or something. And I said, I don't care. I said, we are opening our doors. And it wasn't because I was brave. It's because I was weak. And I know I have to be in God's house. And I know that I have to be with God's people. It's not because I was some John Wayne. It's because I'm too weak to stay out of church. It's all these Strong people that can spend years out of church and then go around going, I'm not that strong. I come here because I need accountability and I need people to stir me up and I need to have somebody pull my head out of the sand every once in a while. And I need to hear God's word. When I preach, I, I go home and listen to my own sermon so I can preach to myself one more time. I, I, Amen. Man, get some preventatives in your life so that you don't opt out of being useful. And that you don't become smug over the things that God did for you when you didn't deserve it 
ever and could not have accomplished it in your own strength. And humble yourself before the Lord to the point where you said, I'd rather, I will rather die than God not use me. I'm ready. I'd rather die than be unuseful for God. And if you're still breathing air, God's still got a plan for your life. If he brought you to this point, then everything you have learned is useful for the kingdom today. Use it all for the glory of God. And let's make an impact in this in, in this world. And let's be a light and let's be a reason for people to get saved. Because we have purposed in our heart with our whole life to win some for the glory of God. Amen. Let's all stand up this morning. You know, we're touchy-feely in this church. I don't know how to be any other way. If you're not touchy-feely because you still are scared of COVID, that's okay. Just elbow somebody, elbow to elbow. But otherwise, or just put your hand in their chest and say no. But uh, otherwise, can we just, uh, can we hold hands today? Can we grab somebody by the hand, pray for each other? Lord, we're too weak uh, to do this alone. We're not meant to fight these battles by ourselves. Lord, so many of us have been beat up by our own sin. And yet you've spared our lives, God, and you love us and it's true, but you want us holy. You want us to live our lives on purpose, Lord. I know there are distinctions between that generation and this because of who Christ is in us. And I believe, Holy Spirit, you will quicken us, Lord, and you won't leave us or forsake us. But Lord, I know that there are times where we have given the devil an inch and he's taken a mile. And it's been destructive, Lord, on a lot of levels. And I know there are a lot of ministries, Lord, that seem to be doing good and then things get crazy. And I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to help us to be humble in this season of our life and walk, Lord God, close to you, grateful. And remove from us a bitter, complaining spirit, Lord God, and mouth. And Holy Spirit of God, take the anger out of us, O oh God. And Lord, put in us a passion, Holy Spirit of God, for the things of God. And to run to win. And to shoot for a prize for our life, Lord, and a mark of fruitfulness for your kingdom, I pray. And Lord, let this be a work that is a humble work, a steadfast work. And a work, Lord God, that is thankful and geared to be a praise to you for the rest of our lives. Take what is remaining of our time and our lives and use it for your kingdom mightily, I pray. Now pray for that person on your left hand or your right that they would finish strong and they would finish humbly before you. Jesus, we pray for each other. Come on, pray, church. Pray for one another this morning. Holy Spirit, I pray. Where can we go, Lord? What part of the desert, Lord, do we belong to apart from you, Lord Jesus? There's nothing. There's nothing but you. You are our life. You are our rock. Jesus. Now repent in your heart today for wanting the things of this world. Repent today. Say, Lord, just use me, God. Clean me up and use my life for your kingdom, I pray. Just ask him today, Lord. We, we ask you to clean us up, Lord. Forgive us. Be merciful to us. I speak over this church that God is about to bless this church's socks off. He's about to do some things for this church that we've never seen. And God is going to, and is doing. I mean, all around us, we see what God is doing. And Father, I pray, Lord, for us to stay humble and for you to be our portion. All the rest of our life, you be our treasure. You be our everything, Lord. And all we want to do is just be in your presence, God. Holy Spirit of God, we thank you. Can we take one more minute today and just praise him? for what he has done in our families, for his mercy that has been so great toward our lives, 
Lord, we thank you today, God, for restoring us, Jesus. You didn't have to, and you did it because you loved us, Holy Spirit, because your heart is for us, because of who you are to us, God, our rock. Holy Spirit of God today, Lord, we thank you for our families. Help us to steward what you've given us. Help us to do it well in the comfort of the Holy Spirit and in the fear of the Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name today. And everybody said amen. Amen. We have prayer counselors in the front. If you need help today, come and pray with us this morning. And if you're new, we can come under the exit sign and say hi to you. And right in about 10 minutes, we're going to start our, our, our little business meeting. So come back. In about 10 minutes, we'll have that begin. God bless you today. We love you. Amen.